Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, bridesmaids in the Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe now. Just a reminder that Big Mood, Little Mood with Daniel M. Lavery happens twice a week. Slate Plus members get an additional mini episode or Little Big Mood every Friday. Sign up now to listen at slate.com slash mood. Hello and welcome back to Big Mood, Little Mood. I am in the studio this week as your host, Danny Lavery. And before I introduce you to our guests, I want to mention that in a little over a month, Slate will be releasing a Dear Prudence book anthology of my tenure as Dear Prudence. That's going to be coming out April 4th, and you can pre-order it now or get it at bookstores and places where generally you find books in the very near future. So do keep an eye out for that. Uh, and then with me in the studio this week is Amy S. Choi and Rebecca Lehrer, the co-founders of the Mashup Americans. Together, they co-host a new podcast series called Grief Collected. With curiosity and empathy as the driving forces, the series asks if Americans even know how to grieve. Amy, Rebecca, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are so, so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm so looking forward to it too, as well. And I, I love the copy for that because it, it's also like, it's a little aggressive. It's like, do you even know how to grieve? What's the matter with you? Um, and and I always really, really like that kind of energy. So, um. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's American, right? Make it competitive from the start. Do you know how to grieve, right? America's next top mourner. <laughs> <laughs> it turns out we may we may not know. So that's the answer. <laughs> well, that's very very exciting. I. I don't know that there's lots and lots of grief in today's letters. I feel like I, I tried to keep an eye out, but um, I'll have you rank me on it at the end of the episode. Also American. We love to rank. Yeah, we love mm, to. We're going to rank it. Just tell me how I'm doing. Give me a grade. <laughs> uh, give me some homework. But do you feel do you feel ready? Do you feel prepared to tell people how to how to live their lives? I mean, I, I mean we I were born, born ready. <laughs> ready for this. <laughs> Ask our spouses. <laughs> I mean, I would love to now do an episode where both of your spouses come on the show. So at the end of this. They're like, my my wife told me that I'm supposed to say. Yeah, just give me just give me their email addresses after we're done recording and I'll do one with each half and it's going to be perfect. Oh, Lord. <laughs> All right. So with that promise, by the way, that's that's a promise that you are now bound to uphold. I will read our first letter and we can get started. The subject is lost in love. I'm seeking advice in my long-term relationship. I'm a cis woman in my early 30s, and I recently got engaged to my longtime partner, Everett, also in their early 30s and non-binary. We've been together for about five years. They're easily the kindest, warmest, most caring partner I've ever had. We love each other deeply and have so much respect for one another. We've also been through a lot together. That being said, I've also had this enduring anxiety about our lack of a sexual relationship. We had great sex and a lot of it when we first fell in love, but there's been a gradual decline with some fits and starts, and now neither of us are making any attempt to initiate. They've endured some sexual trauma in their teens that they still struggle with, which I deeply empathize with. Additionally, body image issues also interfere for both of us. I've started addressing this concern with them, but the conversation ends with a lot of tears because they're so terrified that I'll leave. The thought of ending such a loving relationship is excruciating but I feel so sexually disconnected from myself and at sea. Is this future marriage doomed? Have I been fooling myself into thinking this incompatibility doesn't matter when it does? How will I know for sure this is the right path? Oh boy. Yeah, I felt just a lot of warmth and affection for both this letter writer and her partner. Um, you know, mm. sometimes you get a letter and you have a sort of instinctive sense over someone that you think is closer to right or whose sort of needs you want to prioritize. But this just really sounds like a situation with two loving, attentive people with kind of conflicting 
relationships to talking about something difficult. And and I hope, my hope is that we can help them find better ways to talk about this rather than say like, one of you is right, one of you is wrong. Mm-hmm. I think the thing that like, I actually didn't read this or see this until just listening to you read the letter out loud. But in my head, I had read the letter writer saying, I feel so sexually disconnected from my from my partner and at sea. Mm-hmm. And I actually now see that it's, I feel so sexually disconnected from myself mm-hmm. and at sea. And to me, that feels like the kernel of all of this is that like, you have to love yourself first. You have to know yourself first. All You have to heal yourself first. All of those things that the disconnect from their partner seems secondary to the disconnection completely from themselves in this. Mm-hmm. I think like honoring that and just seeing that like, oh, this is this is like a huge deal, like this moment right there or like that even being able to acknowledge that feels really, really big. Yeah, I think that's also really helpful for me in terms of trying to decide what type of advice I want to give the two of them. Mm -hmm. I know often when it comes to questions like my long term partner and I don't have sex the way that we used to, there's sort of different concerns around is the goal try to have more sex? Is the goal try to have sex in different ways? Is it uh, open up the possibility of a different kind of relationship? And I don't know that I have really strong feelings uh, or, or even any evidence either for or against couples who have been together for a long time whose sex lives have dwindled or waned, then eventually getting to a place where they uh, have sex the way that they used to. Mm. So I don't want to say either definitively that never happens or that's definitely going to happen if you just apply the right amount of like willingness, grit, pluck, and effort. But I think my hope for this couple is I want you both to be able to talk about this with one another in ways that are as honest as possible and that take time to acknowledge your partner's like fears and 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 weeping but doesn't stop there. Because right now the conversation keeps stopping with Everett's really upset, Everett's really worried. We can go no further down this conversational path because Everett's too afraid. Um, And again, I don't think that that's like manipulative on on Everett's part or like an attempt to forestall. It's just, you've both gotten stuck there. And I want you to be able to get past that. I cannot though promise you, if you get past that, you two are going to have conversations where you really minutely identify what's led you to both withdraw from uh, sex with one another, and then you will fix them. And then you will, if not go back to having the kind of sex you did when you first met, have some sort of like ideal monogamous settled, like, well, we have sex X number of times a week and I feel pretty good about that. I I don't know that that's going to be an outcome, but I do think it is reasonable to hope you can have a better conversation than you're having right now. It was a long way of getting at what I hope for them. Do either of you have sort of hopes for potential outcomes here? Yeah, I had a similar thought. And, you know, we're big fans of the show. And I've noticed that as a theme, at least lately, is a a lot about a fear of communication, a lot of fear of what will happen if you say a thing and then the person gets hurt Mm -hmm. or cries. And there's so much love here. You can feel that just so much love that it feels even in spite of or all of the trauma that Everett certainly has and both both and the letter writer potentially as well, there's so much love that I, I, I completely agree. There has to be a way to have the conversation because it actually is important to the letter writer. That's what I'm hearing here and what I read here, that actually while the love and security and love of the relationship are so beautiful that their sexuality, the the letter writer, her sense of her needing to have sex and feeling disconnected with because of that with herself mm-hmm. and potentially with Everett as well, um, it will not get better <laughs> if she doesn't deal with it. And I, to your point, I'm like, there could be lots of ways if you can be open. Mm-hmm. That seems to me the the ability to say, we can do this together, not to set, you know, let's figure this out together, what our individual needs are and how to either you're finding out as a team and maybe ultimately you can't, but to forego your own sexuality and your own sexual needs, I I think it's a non-starter ultimately, like for a really rich, beautiful life together Again, like you said at the beginning, there's so many ways. Maybe you'll find somebody, maybe you guys will figure out 
an open marriage or there's a, or, but that requires even more communication. So, but to me, my main hope is that the letter writer, specifically because she came to us looking for this advice, uh, understands really what she's saying is that her sexuality is very, and sex is very important to her, Mm -hmm. and that she figures out a way to articulate that instead of forego it. Yeah. That's my main hope for her. I just think the actual questions being, the questions that are being posed at the end of the letter from our letter writer is, is the future marriage doomed? Have I been fooling myself? How will I know if it's the right path? Rebecca makes a really good point that the letter writer's sexuality is a critical part of who she is. You know, like everybody, a great sex life is determined differently by every single person, right? And this is one of the fundamental parts of the letter writer that she's concerned about. I just think a question like, is the marriage doomed? There are so so many nearly impossible things that come up in a long-term relationship or in a marriage. And sex is one of so many that to me, it's like my hope is that this becomes like a practice round for how to broach these impossible, daunting seeming topics when you do feel at la- at sea from yourself and you do feel at sea from your partner, because I think those inevitably come up in a long and successful marriage, right? Because we all change over time. And there's different parts where we like kind of get lost in ourselves or get lost away from ourselves, or we wander into periods of, of crises. And that the only way to get through them is to keep that open line of communication. So my hope for the letter writer would be that understanding that this is um, incredibly difficult and daunting to broach But the more you do this kind of thing, the more ultimately successful like a long relationship will be because you'll have to have similar, scary, hard conversations all the time in a marriage. Yeah, I I think all that's really, really useful. I I think I want to add to that, you know, letter writer, you ask, is this future marriage doomed? You know, good news is no. But um, (laughs) I think the the, maybe a, a different way of framing that question would be is what we're doing right now when it comes to talking about sex working. And I think the answer there pretty clearly is no. Right. Instead of, is this doomed? I think the question you should be asking is, um, does something need to change? And and that's pretty straightforwardly yes. And the thing that needs to change is the way you two talk about sex together. And so I think one place to start is by saying with Everett, I know I've brought this up a few times in the past, And we've gotten stalled because you've gotten really upset and afraid of the thought that I might leave. And then we've just ended the conversation there and and tended to your fear. And I don't say any of that to blame you or, or fault you. I just am telling you, I'm bringing this up in large part because I am committed to being with you. You know, if you were, if I just wanted to leave... I, I wouldn't talk to you about this. I would keep it to myself. I'd be looking for other partners without sharing that with you. I'd be looking for the door. You don't have to put it in quite such strong terms, of course, letter writer, but I think that's a useful way of framing this. This is not, um, I think maybe Everett's thinking about this in a sort of like magical thinking way. Like if we name and acknowledge the fact that we're not having sex and haven't for a while, then it becomes newly real in a way that I could kind of hope or pretend it wasn't before. And if it's real, then it's bad. And if it's bad, it's probably never going to get better. And so if we talk about it honestly, we're ensuring that it's going to destroy us. As opposed to, it's already happening. It's already here. We're both already struggling with it. I would just like to talk to you about it. Um, That is a good thing. Yeah. So I think that's a good way to try to at least start the conversation and to just say, like, if you cry or if you get anxious, that's okay. We can deal with that for a minute, but then we're going to get back to the conversation. And I think that'll be good for both of you to sort of realize one of you can be afraid or anxious, get a little upset, even cry, and then you can keep going. It does not mean everything has to go back in the box. You never discuss it again. It's just too big and bad and serious. You know, one of the things that I try to practice too in those in that regard is, you know, we all have many different communication styles or the way we can hear information is sometimes is like, let's come up with a plan together about maybe what would be the best way to have this conversation, the best context, or do we want to find somebody to help us have the conversation? 
or the time of day to have the conversation. Because sometimes if it feels like a team effort, it feels less scary to the other person who's being, who maybe isn't bringing it up. And so I, I, you know, letter writer, I don't know how you and Everett, if you've been to, you know, a counselor or a therapist, and that might be another step. But even in advance of that is say, it may be that, hey, I would love to have this conversation with you. I love you. And that's why I want to talk about it along Daniel's lines of saying that. And then to say, maybe set a time, maybe tomorrow morning, we could come to this together. You know, sometimes it, depending on the person, it can feel good to know that it's coming. Mm -hmm. And I I personally, I like that. (laughs) Sometimes I get barraged with, you know, a call being like, here's all the things I have to say about something. I'm like, wait, you just dysregulated my nervous system and I don't have time to respond Mm -hmm. in a way that is thoughtful. So depending on how you guys interact with the same loving kindness and respect for each other, set it up the same way. You know, it's about finding the way the other person can hear you and asking them to come along to help you with that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think thinking of like, if it's too stressful having this conversation like over your kitchen table in the middle of the house that you share, by all means, you know, have the conversation out on a walk or in just some sort of like different physical space or in a way that's not just sitting across from each other, like you're having a job interview. Um, that that can all be useful. I, I think I'll also add, you know, letter writer, you mention a couple of things about you and your partner that I think you are offering as possible explanations for this change in your sex life. And I just want to encourage you to keep an open mind on that front. Uh, Not to say that anything that you brought up sounds totally out of left field to me, just that since you and Everett haven't had many conversations about this honestly yet, you don't necessarily know 100% what's going on with them. You know, so I think good questions are, like, is Everett happy with your you know, the fact that you two aren't having sex right now and is afraid to talk about it because they're worried that that will upset you. Does Everett also feel like sadness and grief about the change and loss of your sex life and wants to change it but doesn't know how? Because those would be two really different perspectives that would require different things from you. So I think even that aside about, you know, Everett suffered some sexual trauma that they still struggle with, again, that might be useful information, but you also say that the two of you used to have a lot of really frequent great sex. And again, I, I I know people can kind of go through different experiences with relation to past trauma throughout the course of their life, but it doesn't seem like the trauma was holding them back from having the kind of sex life with you that they used to at the time. So I would just be careful now about suggesting it as a as a reason. And, and again, I would encourage you to be curious as you talk to um, Everett as well as yourself. You don't go into a ton of detail about the body image issues, but I'm just curious if, and again, this can be really intense to talk about with somebody else. So you can have some of this conversation just by yourself in private if you like, but you know, are these body image issues new? Did you have them five years ago? Are they in any way for either of you connected to stuff like cisness, non-binariness, the possibility of transition, do any of them have to do with something you might like to change? And again, there's so many possible uh, driving forces behind body image issues. I don't mean to uh, offer just like a simple suggestion that will fix any or all of them, just that it's useful to know what's the issue, how long have I been dealing with it, has what I've been doing with it in dealing with it worked so far? And if not, do I want to try something else? And and then the last thought I want to sort of add is, this is, I think, outside of my realm of expertise at a certain point, because like long-term monogamous relationships are not something I have historically a ton of experience with. But I'm aware that this is also incredibly common, that long-term domestic intimacy honesty, stuff that like the letter writer mentions as we've been through a lot together, things that can make for an incredibly intimate and deeply committed, loving relationship. Sometimes, not always, but sometimes perhaps even often is a barrier to, you know, fun, high libido, lust and sex. Not Again, not always, not everybody. It's not like a guaranteed rule in life, but I will say many, many couples who have been together for many years experience a sort of paradoxical increase in, I love you more, I respect you more, I'm closer to you, I know you better. And even though I still find you like 
attractive, there's just some sort of disconnect between, of course, you're attractive versus I don't look at you and want to like jump your bones. Um, And that can be really distinct from I'm no longer attracted to you or I'm no longer attracted to anyone or there's something about a relationship that's really bothering me. Just that like this is not a weird problem that's just befallen the two of you. You have a lot of company. This is why Esther Perel has a career. Um, and <laughs> I was going to say. I, like, like, if anything, again, I, I feel bad because I haven't read any of her stuff. So I don't know. Like, I don't want to recommend it because maybe it's totally antithetical to anything I would want a letter writer to do. But like, you know, she wrote the book, Mating in Captivity. She's clearly thought something about like domesticity and sex drive. So I don't know. Give it a shot. See what she has to say. See if it sounds totally unreasonable or not. Have either of you read her? Yes, I have and listened a lot. So I I can't say how it jives with your ideas necessarily, but I do think it's very connected here, which is sometimes your expectations of a relationship don't totally sync up in domesticity and domestic life, don't sync up with like passion and sexuality. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. That might mean you have to figure something else out, but it doesn't mean um, neglecting your sexuality, but it's something extremely common. I mean, I think Amy and I are both in long-term relationships, and I think it's also things are cyclical. Things can go, depending on, as you said, who knows? It could be hormonal changes. 20s to 30s is a big change too in in life, in expectations of yourself, in how your body works. So uh, I love that idea of really leading with a curiosity. And you know this person so well, letter writer. You clearly know Everett so well. This is your, your love. And so you can probably guess a lot of things. On the other hand, being curious might actually unlock something for both of you. And I, and I think that's something that I, as a bossy lady and a, and a bossy partner myself, I try to work on is how can I be curious about where you're coming from as opposed to assuming I know exactly what it is and, and making decisions only based on that. Yeah. Well, I think one of our mantras lately has been like, what is the story I tell myself? Like the story I tell myself about this is X. And so, you know, like maybe letter writer, we think about like, what's the story you're telling yourself versus the story that Everett is telling themselves. And especially when you do love somebody so much and you feel that you know them so well, it becomes infinitely easier to make assumptions about them because we actually do have an intimate knowledge. Like I've been with my husband for, we've been married for 14 years together for 17 years, but we've been friends for like, you know, 10 years beyond that. Like we've just known each other a real long time. And it's very, very easy for me to make assumptions about him. And 80% of the time, they're totally right because I do know him, but like not, I think encouraging you again to have that like curiosity and also uh, without assumptions, curiosity. And this is now where I really wish I had followed my own therapist bossy advice, which was to read the book, Nonviolent Communication, which I always get tips from and always seem really good, but I didn't read. And it's gathering dust alongside all of my other self-help books on my bookshelf. But I think that there's a lot there and like how we make this approach, which is really, you know, I think another thing that stands out in the letter is that at this point, letter writer, you're saying, you know, neither of us are making any attempts to initiate. So maybe the story that Everett is telling themselves is that, is that there also is an interest. Like we don't know what each other's stories are necessarily or what the narrative is in our heads. So being able to like unlock those, I think will open up so much and maybe like reveal completely different information Mm -hmm. than like what we think we've established already. I just think all this is going to be really useful. And the last thing I'll add is just, you know, letter writer, I, I always want to encourage you and Everett to speak really like kindly and lovingly to one another and to make sure that you go into these conversations with whatever sort of additional bolstering or support you need, whether that means bringing in a counselor or, or something else. But I also do want you to think about how can you at least begin by being honest without a filter to yourself about your sexual desires because that and your desires for intimacy because I, I I just want to remind you those can often be intense, unflattering, selfish, cruel, 
you know, not in line with how we want to treat others or ourselves. Um, and none of that's to say, like, you should think of the worst things you can and then find a way to say them all to your partner. But just uh, one thing I would caution you against doing is trying to preemptively edit what you want in order to go easy on Everett, which I think maybe you've already done a little bit of because you're so worried about hurting their feelings. And again, I don't mean you should say something just like really off the cuff and thoughtlessly to Everett tomorrow, but just don't assume that all you really want are a few tweaks or like a weekly date night and then you'll be fine in advance because you think anything more than that will scare Everett or mean you have to break up. Um, I think go for maximal open honesty with yourself in some format that you can do that you don't have to share with anyone. And then you can think about how might I want to share this with a therapist? How might I want to share this with Everett? How might I want to share this with a couples counselor, which would be distinct from how I might talk about it with my own therapist? And again, that's not like cultivate weird secret mean thoughts about your partner and then say a nice version when you're together. I just mean it can be useful if you're the type of person who errs in the direction of, I'm going to decide I only want a little bit so that I know somebody else is going to be comfortable with what I want. Yes. What if I only say yes, just responding to your great advice? I mean, I I think also I, I only have lived in the body of a, a cis woman. Um, I do think that that's extremely common is to, is to try to sublimate or your own sexuality or sexual needs. I thought for a minute you 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 meant like, I think it's extremely common to be a cis woman. I was like, yeah, that, it's very common. Like, oh, yeah. I don't think that's um, like... And then I just bring... This is actually... Quite a few. I'm like, what's the opposite? And then I just start staying stats about cis women. Yeah. I'm like, do you know? We are so... Mar- we are so marginalized. Absolutely. No, Anyways. L- um, lots of women, lots of queer people, lots of victims of sexual trauma. There's like a lot of Venn diagrams for that. And so especially, I don't know... Like if the letter writer's other relationships before Everett have also been with like anyone like Everett or if they've been mostly with other cis women or with cis men or something else. So it's also possible there's different like contexts. I don't know when Everett came out, if Everett's been taking any steps towards any sort of medical, hormonal, social transitioning. So all of those could be coming into play here. I don't want to guess, although wouldn't it be fun if we did? Oh, Pure speculation. <laughs> yeah, that's the podcast I tried to start pre-QAnon. <laughs> pure, spe- pure speculation. Now Let's you can't guess do it. everyone's birth assignment. <laughs> the show that makes me want to jump off a bridge. <laughs> oh, wait. wow. What a nightmare. What a true nightmare. I've gotten us very off track. I'm very sorry. You were making an excellent point. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I just simply say that, and thank you for pointing that out about the Venn diagrams. I just, I love that, the way you said that, Danny, which is just, you have to know your truth and don't sugarcoat it basically Mm -hmm. so that you can be clear about it because otherwise you'll never get to something that feels satisfying. And I think knowing what you need is it's, it's just that the disconnection from yourself, as Amy pointed out at the top of this combo, don't like how, how can you connect with yourself? Yeah. That will release so much. And um, we don't think your future marriage is doomed. We we are so excited for you to take this path to have these conversations and to find yourself and find yourselves and a path forward. That I feel a lot of hope for you both, yeah. actually, because there's so much love here. I agree. I know. Everybody's so nice in this letter. I like yeah. this letter. And okay, I know I've said like three times is my last thought. Here's my last, last, last thought. Letter writer, <laughs> if you find that trying to approach this with Everett, Everett is still having a difficult time continuing the conversation beyond the point of tears. I would encourage you to share, um, you know, this with them, which is Everett, right now, my worst fear is that you want to be in a relationship where we never talk about this. And my worst fear is not um, this or that outcome for our sex life, but it's a marriage where I feel like I can never talk to you about intimacy and sex because you refuse to. And I feel isolated, alone, and rejected. And I don't want that. So that way it really frames it not as like, either you start talking about this with me and we have to start having sex in a way that you don't want, or not talking about it is the only thing keeping us safe. It's making it clear like why not talking about it is damaging. Um, And I think, I hope they will respond to that. Please do write back. I would love to hear more about how this conversation is going. And just again, the goal right now should be to have better conversations. I don't know what the outcome for your sex life is going to look like after that. It could go in a number of different directions. But the goal right now is improve the conversations. (laughs) 
Big Mood, a Little Mood is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. While you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy, and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average, and auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So, just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now and get a quote on your car insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates national average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts are not available in all states or situations. Hey there, it's Janae Desmond-Harris, a.k.a. Dear Prudence, here to tell you a little secret I've been holding on to. Slate's Dear Prudence podcast is back. That's right. We're back to answer your questions and hopefully give you some good advice. And as always, I can't do this alone. I'll be joined by our amazing guests who know a thing or two about giving advice. You should just let 13-year-olds fight. You should not get in the middle of four 13-year-olds fighting with each other and try and break them up because you are just going to like twist your ankle or like break a finger. Whether you're a teen dealing with parents, people can be unpredictable and nonsensical and sometimes parents and humans in general just don't make any goddamn sense. Spicing up your sex life. Or is it simply, you know, I don't have two penises, so I can't do this. <laughs> <You know? laughs> or just need some validation that you're not losing it. I love it when everyone's like, this is a minor issue, it's low stake, as if most of my questions are about like peace in the Middle East or something. Dear Prudence is here to help you navigate all the complicated and tricky bits of life, while hopefully helping you see the humor along the way. Each week, I'll answer your questions about overbearing parents, flaky friends, and that one coworker who just won't take a hint. But the most important voice will always be yours. Join us for Slate's Dear Prudence every Friday, starting February 17th. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. All right. Luckily, the next letter, I think, is going to have a fairly short answer because I really took us on some digressions here. But I will read it and we will answer it and then things will continue. The subject is sentimental and scared. I recently found an ornament made for my ex-fiance as a baby by his now deceased grandmother. They were extremely close. During our relationship, he made it clear that he loved this item and the memories associated with it. I'd be crushed if I lost something like this due to an ex, and I feel strongly that I should return it. The problem I'm having is logistical. I can't deliver it due to proximity, and I can't give him my return mailing address for my own safety. He was a decent person until I tried to end our engagement due to differences in lifestyle that we couldn't overcome. He stalked me for months, put a tracking device on my car, hacked my Wi-Fi to monitor when I was home, hacked my bank accounts, and left me feeling trapped and suicidal. I can't reopen any contact again. His family was always truly wonderful to me, and it feels heartless to trash something irreplaceable that I know they would all want back. It's been a few years since I've heard from him now, so it's possible he has changed, but I don't want to find out the hard way. Is there a way I'm not thinking of to return this without sacrificing my hard-won safety? I have my hand up in the air because I feel so strongly about this letter. The floor recognizes your hand. (laughs) Thank you. Wait, the chair recognizes your hand. Your hand has the floor. Sorry. (laughs) I, first of all, letter writer, thank you for being honest about everything. And I'm so sorry for everything that this ex put you through. And I think there are like, I came up with a million different logistical ways that you could get this ornament back to him. But the thing that like feels so fundamental to me that I know I have struggled with so much in my life and so many people, really good people I know struggle with is that the idea that you always have to do the right thing, even when somebody has wronged you in every possible way. Like this person hacked you, stalked you, tracked you, hacked your bank accounts, took you to the point of being suicidal, you do not owe this person and by proxy their family 
anything. And I think that that's to me is when I read something like this feels like the core of like, but I want to do the right thing. And I really honor that. And I think that's such a beautiful impulse. And also to do the right thing at the expense or at the cost of even even the weight of this, of the fear of like contact being reestablished because you want to do the right thing by him and by his family when they have done everything wrong to you feels so heartbreaking to me. And so it's like such a difficult thing that I know, like I have a, I have some complicated relationships in my family. Danny, I know you have complicated relationships here. It's just like, you know, the eternal battle of being like, but a good person would do this or like the right thing to do would be to do this when somebody has done endlessly wrong things to you. I just like, there's ways that we can certainly help you get this package back to this person's family. And also I, I wish, I hope, and I pray for this letter writer to feel free from the obligation to do anything for this person. Yeah. And to do anything more for this person. I I really share that sentiment that I, I want to help this letter writer find a way to get free of something. And I, I think I think I have an idea that will be useful to them when it comes to reframing this. So with that in mind, letter writer, I, I know there are ways to send mail without a return address, but I don't want to get into that because here's what I think is the key issue. Regardless of if you sent this to his parents or a sibling or a cousin, even if the return address was not available, even if your name wasn't on the package, he would know where it came from. And so I think this is actually a question about you have to prioritize your safety first. And that is, if he were to receive this ornament, there would be no doubt where it came from. It wouldn't be maybe somebody found it on the street and and returned it. He would know it came from you. And as you say, you don't know if he's changed and you don't want to find out the hard way. And so I think if you were to return this item, even if it were done in complete anonymity, he would immediately know it came from you. And it's very, very possible that he would take that as a desire to reestablish contact or simply remind him of the rush he used to get when it came to stalking you. And so I think that even if you sent this back totally anonymously, it would be an unacceptable risk to your own safety. And I cannot therefore recommend that you send it to him or even plan to send it to him in 20 years. So I would say, you know, if you can't bring yourself to just destroy it, which you have my full permission to do, you could give it to a Goodwill or a secondhand vintage place that that sells knickknacks. But I, I think, you know, if anything, it will help you to remember that oftentimes people who stalk and abuse their partners not necessarily always plan it from day one, but, you know, they certainly take advantage of regular intimacy and domesticity, like the fact that when you date someone, you often leave your stuff at their house, um, or sometimes you pass on family heirlooms, um, and all of a sudden, normal, um, like, bindings of reciprocity that in, like, a regular breakup you might feel obligated to um, uphold now become, like, traps and, and dangerous when, when somebody becomes abusive and stalks you. So I, I don't mean to suggest he left you that ornament in part to control you in the future, but I, I think that's possibly why he did it. And it is. Like we've already devoted time and energy. This ex-fiance has now exuded like fear mm-hmm. and energy and power into your life again through this ornament. And through the anguish that you have of wanting to do, feeling so strongly that you have to reconnect with his family again. And it's it's such a hard, hard thing to break. And it is, um, I think I would encourage just reminding yourself that you are not the keeper of this object. Mm -hmm. Right. Like you are not responsible for this object the same way that you are not responsible for this person's behavior and that you are not responsible for his memories or for his family's memories of their dead grandmother. You are now a free person who it sounds like from everything worked so hard to get free to taking legal ramifications. I'm assuming moving to a faraway place, like all of these things. And that your responsibility is to yourself and keeping yourself safe. Yep. 
And especially because you don't say anything about what his family did during those months of stalking. But mm-hmm. I notice you don't mention they tried to stop him or they told him to leave me alone or they said, I'm so sorry this is happening because he's stalking you. So that does tell me that they are not, um, you couldn't just like send it to an aunt and hope she wouldn't say anything. You know, like they're all a weak link. You cannot trust any of them to help prioritize your safety. And and that's just it. He has other memories. I'm sure there are other heirlooms and mementos within the family. I'm sure the only, she didn't die with only one ornament left. They have other things to remember her by. And at the risk of getting too gallows humor about this, you know, this guy had months where he was stalking you and knew exactly when you were at home. If he really wanted the damn ornament, he could have come over when he knew you weren't around and stolen it. So it's not even like, wow, this poor guy uh, didn't have the opportunity to get his stuff back. Like you forfeit the right to get your stuff back when you endanger somebody else's safety and you stalk them. So again, it's not like, oh, we're going to give you permission to not do the right thing, but other people should. It's that it would not be the right thing to give this to him. It would be hurting you. This is this is not an obligation that you're allowed to give up. This is a non-obligation, if that makes sense. And if you're worried that you won't have the sort of like presence of mind or, or emotional stability to do it by yourself, call a friend and just say, I found something from my old ex who used to stalk me and I know I need to get it out of the house and find a way to dispose of it, but I don't know how and I want some support and and let them come over and help you and, you know, be angry on your behalf, be strong on your behalf. That can be really helpful when you yourself feel a false sense of obligation to a former abuser. I particularly love that last piece, Danny, because I think you let a writer show so much humanity here, you know, your own humanity. I'd be crushed if I lost something like this due to an ex um, and feel you feel strongly sh- you should return it. But this isn't an ex. This right. is an abuser. This right. is, um, and you're, you're putting, you know, this is what a good person does, right? You're trying to be like, oh, if I had this, I would want it back. But yeah. the person who abused you isn't owed that and doesn't deserve that. Any version of a loving, trusting, respectful thing, like your action, like you wanted to take, has been lost. They yeah. don't deserve that. And so, you know, your humanity and the way you're retaining it is so beautiful and worth it. And don't waste it on this creep. Yeah. So if you can release yourself of any feeling of pressure around that, I love the idea of calling a friend. Because you call me, I'll be like, I will... Beyonce lemonade style, smash it with yeah, the back. I'll, I'll drive you know? over it with my car. Like I would have no qualms. I would be like, "Fuck you, fuck your grandma." <laughs> and it's I not her fault. It's not the grandma's no, fault. But she's dead. Yeah. Uh, let's. I mean, but let's do a whole ritual around it. If there's something else here that maybe, hopefully, your therapist or somebody else who has been through with you through this, who understands and can really support you through what you have endured, you know, to say like. Maybe there's something else we don't know, and I, I'm very, very much not a therapist, but that you might want to release here too, that yeah. having this in your home is holding on to, or feeling a need that you need to somehow connect, and to Danny's point, that your ex will know that it came from you, even if it's anonymous and they can't find you easily. And I, I love that all of us were like, we could think of a hundred logistical ways. Don't get me, I'm a good at logistics. Yeah. If in the future you want to send something without a <laughs> yeah, return address, then, you can. Then. You can go to the post <laughs> office, no, you can go to UPS store. Don't worry about it. Exactly. But I do think that the, in this case, there might be something that you need to release here because yeah. this has bubbled up for you and it's been several years. So I would think about that. Again, maybe there's maybe there's something. We if we just think of the energy of the three of us. Again, running it over. If that's what I would you need, pour acid on it. We could melt yeah. it. Yeah, find the friend who, in this kind of instance, um, empowers you, and and be empowered to 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 release this yeah. because they don't deserve this. No, that raises a really good point. So I I had this experience. It's not it's not quite as um, scary, but I think you know maybe ten years ago when I was having like a really big shift in my relationship to my parents and what I wanted my relationship with them to look like and the kind of um, 
ways I felt like I was breaking free from some like bad patterns and like kind of yucky ways that we were communicating with each other. I had like this really impossible time taking these two fucking ugly paintings that they had given me off of my walls that I had like carried around with me, like since my very first apartment. And at this point I was like, you know, 35 years old and it was hanging like in places that you couldn't quite see, but I felt too guilty to take them off of my walls in my then apartment with like my two children. And it took a while, but I think what, what I came to in therapy was that those paintings, even though I like visually hated them, they were not beautiful objects that I wanted that, And it was more than just guilt that kept me holding on to them because somebody had given to me and then I felt like the the caregiver for these objects. It was that for me, they were just like a representation of a hope of a relationship that like my parents would come and see it and then they would love it and then we would have it. And that it was like it was a hope for a relationship that did not exist or at least did not exist anymore in any form. And I just wonder, like, there, there's a reason why we imbue objects with so much importance. And some of them are really beautiful and some of them are really tragic and some of them are really hard. So I'd also just, like, encourage the letter writer to think, like, this is just an ornament, mm-hmm. right? Like, it has, we, we have seen in the letter that you're imbuing it with all this value because it's sentimental to the family. But, like, why do you feel such a responsibility to shepherd this object? Right. And to care for this object in this way. And and especially if, sorry, I just think if if you had a friend who was in a similar situation, I don't think letter writer, you would say, yes, you do owe it to the family. I think it would be very clear to you immediately. No, I love you and your safety matters. You cannot send it back. A hundred percent. I think it's something that, that it's worth inquiring of yourself, like why you're holding on to this thing. Oh, I'm so glad you wrote Letter Writer because we are we are we are here for you. Just yeah. no. <laughs> Just no. You, nope. Oh, yeah. Please write us back. Let us know. I hope you destroy it, but if you don't, let us know what you did do. Or send it, to, send it to us and we will destroy oh, it. Oh my God. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Mail it to me. Um I I'd give out my mailing address, but I don't want my relatives to have mine. So we're we're at an impasse here. <laughs> This feels like a great moment to pause in between letters. Um, you two think a lot about grief. You, you, I think, want to be helpful to other people in terms of how they think about grief. Uh, tell us a little bit about the show. You don't have to go into a lot of details about your own grief, obviously. But if you want to, you're, you're certainly free to. Um, but yeah, I'd love to just hear a little bit more about um, how you guys came to that project. Yeah, so the Mashup Americans itself, we're actually in celebrating our 10th anniversary of our studio of our work, which is really... Thank, thank you. you. It's a big deal. And uh, as you know, making things, uh, media things in the world, 10 years is a long time, which has really been about celebrating and digging into our hyphen identities, being you know first-generation Americans, navigating multiple cultures, being really deeply rooted in some things and also looking to the future and the inherent tensions in that, right? And, and including all these very related to these conversations about how, what do you actually, what is enriching you from your history and what do you let go of? Because it's not. And those are like, we have a whole section on our website about guilt. And we also make stuff with partners um, with this lens in mind. And so the grief series, you know, it, it bubbled up during COVID, but just a sense of what does it mean to actually grieve and what does it mean to experience loss and both death loss and then also loss of other kinds of losses, which are like the loss of a future you thought you would have and and a lot of uh, the loss of, you know, different expectations. Uh, there's many, many versions a loss of, of loss. identity. Mm-hmm. And we wanted to navigate that both because we know that from sort of some of our rooted traditions, we have some really wonderful ways of uh, rituals and containers, techno- ancient technologies, as they say, around grief and grieving. But we are very much also in an American context and we are Americans and feeling like there was no way, even just marking the deaths of people who've died from COVID, which is what, over a million Americans? There's no real marker of that. And it feels 
disgraceful (laughs) as many things. And so we wanted to ask those questions, which are also related to our our own experiences. I personally, a lot of uh, grief and tragedy in high school, loss of several friends in very tragic ways, as well as some loss of innocence stuff that happened in traumatic ways to me and to my body. Um, So those are the kinds of seeds of this conversation. And we wanted it to, it was really like talking to experts uh, about it. And Amy could tell you a little bit about some of the experts and the meditations that we also did in the project. Yeah, I think, you know, there's so many beautiful grief storytelling projects out there um, that we so respect and admire. And I think for us, we really wanted to dig in to, you know, what is the science of grief? What is the what are the spiritual aspects of grief? How do we learn from experts, sociologists, psychologists, historians, religious scholars about how grief impacts our bodies, our souls, like our families, how families shift in grief and our communities. And then with the ultimate understanding that like, and I think we all get this once we experience a grief of our own, is how um, transformative grief is. And so if we can all acknowledge that grief is transformative, then what is, what's going to come next? You know, we were very not interested in um, making grief productive or Mm -hmm. in trying to find any sort of like, well, here's going to be the silver lining of 3,000 people dying every week of COVID. But just that acknowledging that this is... How can I optimize my grieving? Oh, yeah. (laughs) Let me give you a checklist. We have a couple different homework assignments. The way that they shit shit on, and by they, I mean all the people we talk to, experts and... Uh, oh, on, those on people Kubler hate Ross. the Kubler Ross. Oh. They really hate. They're <laughs> hey, like, there are wow. no stages. There are no stages. The seven habits of highly effective grievers. <laughs> grievers. Yeah, exactly. Um, oh my God. We felt in the moment that we were, you know, really diving deep into the project that like there was simply a moment, simply the fact that Americans were in grief was not being acknowledged as truth. And that it was impossible to first like to even define what is grief. Because I think people, especially in the pandemic, were like, well, if my mom or kid didn't die, then like, what am I really grieving? We're like, well, we're grieving the upheaval of all of society right now. Mm-hmm. And maybe we're grieving the fact that the upheaval of all society didn't actually change society that much. We just kind of like kept retracting back into what we knew. And so I think, you know, talking to experts both about the historical and ancestral aspects of grief as well as like the neuroscience of what grief can do to your brain and to your body like what is observable fact over time was immensely helpful for us personally and also allowed us to um kind of depathologize grief as like it's not something that just happens to a few people that should remain in like you know, spoken about in hushed whispers, but that grief is a part of life. And if we are, if the Mashup Americans, if the project is about figuring out what it means to live a good life and what it means to be human and in all of this like cultural mishmash, then grief is as much a part of that as celebration or joy. And I think one thing that was really exciting about the project for us is that we got like, you know, real heady with our experts. We got to read so many incredible books and then we learned about how animals grieve. Do you know how oh crows grieve, Danny? Do you I know? Mean, I just finished reading Franz de Waal's a book from the seventies about chimpanzee yes. politics. Uh, so okay. you're on you're on trend. Well, they, we'll they, I was actually really upset because they finally somebody murdered Luit, and I was like, no, Luit. <laughs> um, but then they also all mourned him, so it was like. It felt very like old school Viking, like I have killed him, but let us all mourn him now. <laughs> but this is a gentleman's agreement. Uh, no, but I mean, crows, for example, I mean, th- we talked to this woman, Dor- Dr. Dorothy Hollinger, who wrote a book called The Anatomy of Grief, and it's about grief in your, how it affects your body and mind and heart. And, but talking about animals grieving and, you know, crows, so a murder, that's a group, a murder of crows. A group of crows, right. a murder of crows, they will, their crow friend dies, they go all fly to the corpse, they scream for 15 minutes, then they sit in silence, and then they fly away. And this is, these are birds, you know, yeah. it's incredible. And we all are programmed to do that. So by not creating, not engaging that, not allowing for it, not acknowledging it, you know, we're making 
lives in its kind of what how do you say it Amy like in its in its absence or in mm -hmm. negative space of that loss or grief that we don't acknowledge which is you know the american way um, <laughs> <laughs> we're really but, good at it. So, you know, and I think one thing that was really essential for us was that, you know, having been in our heads and living in these like brains that are floating around in computers, how do we actually bring all these learnings into ourselves in a way? And so with each episode, with each conversation, we paired it with like an artistic meditation. So we had um, Alexander Chi was on reading an essay about grief. We had a beautiful mm -hmm. musician, Daniela Gazuntai, sing four songs about grief that that we had paired with the first episode. Um, Linda Tai, who's a somatic therapist and one of our guests, did kind of a traditional breathing meditation uh, focused on grief. And um, we also had a drawing meditation by Wendy McNaughton. And I think all of these ways of reconnecting ourselves to make sure, like our, our very first letter writer, how do we keep ourselves from floating out to sea when there is so much in the world that we all have to process? And I think, you know, one of the fundamental, again, not objective so much, because again, you know, the, the, the goal was not to be like, how do we make grief work for us? But something that our our guest, Adrian Marie Brown, who is, you know, just astonishing in every way, shape and form. She was like, well, you know, like if we do not understand our grief and let it flow, grief becomes our form. And I think that that is something that increasingly through the decades and the short centuries that America has been in existence, grief has increasingly become our form. So you know, what are ways that we can even begin to think outside of that and break free of that? And um, it was a really beautiful project. Alongside it, we were also working on a rom-com. So mm. those are the really the two sides of our brain. Yeah. Grief and then joy. Mm -hmm. And they're all, you know, grieving is loving. It's been a, actually, it really makes us feel very alive to talk about it. So check it out. It's Grief Collected. And you can we have a beautiful website with lots of, you know, more resources, griefcollected.com. But, um, and this is the way we talk. So we talk this way about grief and there's a lot of laughing and sassy questions. Well, that sounds lovely. Thank you both so much. I'm, I'm really uh, excited to check out the project and just appreciate so much you're sharing it with some of us. I don't know why I said some of us, whoever's listening, I suppose. <laughs> Thank you. you know, of course. We all we we contain multitudes, Danny. Sure. You got it. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for taking some time to talk with me today. I enjoyed it immensely and I'm really looking forward to catching up with the um grief episode. So thank you both again so much and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks for joining us on Big Mood, Little Mood with me, Danny Lavery. Our producer is Phil Circus, who also composed our theme music. Don't miss an episode of the show. Head to slate.com slash mood to sign up to subscribe or hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're using right now. Thanks. Also, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd love to know what you think. If you want more Big Mood, Little Mood, you should join Slate Plus, Slate's membership program. Members get an extra episode of Big Mood, Little Mood every Friday, and you'll get to hear more advice or conversations with our guest. And as a Slate Plus member, you'll also be supporting the show. Go to slate.com forward slash mood plus to sign up. It's just $15 for your first three months. If you'd like me to read your letter on the show, maybe you need a little advice, maybe you need some big advice, head to slate.com slash mood to find our Big Mood, Little Mood listener question form or find a link in the description on the platform you're using right now. Thanks for listening. And here's a preview of our Slate Plus episode coming this Friday. If it bothers you, yeah, just take her aside and say, hey, I'm sure you didn't mean it this way, but it kind of bugs me when you say you're straight and then you join in these jokes. Would you mind easing off on it? You're not telling her, like, go to hell, I hate you. Uh, I think you must hate gay people. I think you're the, like... That's a totally fine thing to say to someone. She might feel a little uncomfortable. She might be a little taken aback. But unless I very much have misjudged the situation, she's not going to like run screaming for the hills and say, I no longer like gay people because one was a little annoyed with me. To listen to the rest of that conversation, join Slate Plus now at slate.com forward slash mood.